All right, let's take a look at this last section. We're going to start with temperature. Um, I told you earlier that as far as temperature goes, there's one unit that we tend to focus on, which is the degrees Celsius. Uh, but we're also going to use that to convert to a final temperature, known as the Kelvin, known as the Kelvin. But um, what I want to show you first is what the relationship between degrees Celsius and degrees Fahrenheit is and how we can use that relationship to ultimately derive equations that allow us to convert from degrees Celsius to Fahrenheit or from degrees Fahrenheit to Celsius. All right, and since the most ubiquitous substance on Earth is water, um, this is historically what was used to make many of the measurements. And so if you look at the melting point and the boiling points of water, right, the point where solid water becomes liquid water and the point where liquid water becomes gaseous water or vapor water, uh, for degrees Celsius, the temperatures are 0 and 100 respectively. In degrees Fahrenheit, the temperatures are 32 and 212 degrees respectively. So what we can do is graph what you know degrees Celsius are and what degrees Fahrenheit are. And what we're going to find out is that they actually yield a linear equation. A linear equation that by default has to have the following format, y equals mx plus b. So what that basically means is that if we plot degrees Celsius versus degrees Fahrenheit, we're going to have the following formula, where degrees Celsius will be the y value and degrees Fahrenheit will be the x value. We're going to have a slope m and a y-intercept b. And if we graph degrees Fahrenheit versus degrees Celsius, then we will have um, degrees Fahrenheit as the y, degrees Celsius as the x. We'll have a slope and an intercept for that equation as well. All right, so here's where we're going to use the data points for the melting and boiling points of water. Specifically, we're going to first determine the slope of the line. All right, so here it goes. We have the degrees Celsius in Fahrenheit. Excuse me, the degrees Celsius in Fahrenheit. What am I saying? We have the degrees Celsius, the final degrees Celsius, and we're going to subtract the initial degrees Celsius from them. And we do the same thing with the degrees Fahrenheit. We um, basically choose the values. I personally choose the values for the boiling point as the finals because those are the higher values and the values for the multiple point as the initial. So notice that for degrees Celsius, I have 100 minus 0, and on the bottom, I have 212 minus 32. Or conversely, for the equation here on the right, uh, I have the 212 minus 32 on top and the 100 minus 0 on the bottom, you know, to make the equation work out. All right, so when you do this, you're going to find out that that equals 100 over 180 or 180 over 100, which basically equals 10 over 18 or 18 over 10. And ultimately, this reduces all the way down to 5 ninths and 9 fifths. All right, so we have the value of the slopes for both equations. What we're going to do now is with the value of the slope and any of the degree Celsius, degree Fahrenheit rows, we're going to find out the value of the intercept. Now, the one that seems to be the most trivial to use is the one for the melting point because the degrees Celsius are zero. So that will allow us to simplify the process a little bit. So I'm going to pick the value of the melting point for degrees Celsius and Fahrenheit in this equation. And I will plug in the value of the slope as well. So we have zero for degrees Celsius minus five ninths times 32 equals B. Okay, those are the melting point values. And over here we have 32 minus five ninths times zero equals B. Okay, so anything multiplied by 0 is going to be 0. So this basically leaves us with negative 5 9 times 32 for the value of b for the first equation. And for the second equation, b is equal to just 32. So we can go back to the original format of the equation and this time plug in just the slope and just the intercept. In which case, the slope is 5 9 for the first equation, 9 fifths for the second equation. The intercept is negative 5 ninths times 32 for the first equation, and it's only 32 for the second. All right, so this equation right here, as written, is indeed the conversion 
that allows us to switch over from degrees Celsius onto Fahrenheit. For this one, we could actually do one extra step. If you notice, you'll see that you have five nines multiplying the degrees Fahrenheit, but you also have five nines multiplying 32. So you could factor out the five nines out of this equation and end up writing this as five nines times degrees Fahrenheit minus 32. And this right here is the equation that you end up finding out online or in your textbooks as the conversion to go from degrees Fahrenheit to degrees Celsius. So simply stated, the degrees that are isolated, that's the degrees that you're looking for. So if you have been given degrees Fahrenheit, you want to use the equation where the degrees Fahrenheit is in combination with numbers. If what you have been given is a degree Celsius, then you want to use the equation where the degrees Celsius are in combination with numbers. All right, now, in addition to this, there's one more temperature scale that you need to be aware of. It's called the Kelvin scale. And the Kelvin scale is probably a lot simpler than the first two. Um, as you can see, all you need to do is add 273 to the degree Celsius scale. And the reason why is because uh, there is a temperature known as absolute zero, which happens to be equal to negative 273. So by adding 273 to the degree Celsius, you ensure that the Kelvin temperature is positive every single time. You will never have a negative Kelvin temperature. And as you'll find out in later topics, having a temperature that doesn't you know, switch from negative to positive is ideal for doing certain calculations. All right, so let me show you an example of temperature and what you do with it. Let's say that we have a relatively hot day, 90 degrees Fahrenheit. I want to find out what that corresponds to in Kelvin. The thing to keep in mind is that degrees Fahrenheit and Kelvin don't have a direct uh, relationship, but you can switch over from degrees Fahrenheit to degrees Celsius. And once you have degrees Celsius, you can go to Kelvin. So we're going to input this into the equation you see here. We have 90 for Fahrenheit, so we'll input 90 inside the parentheses. 90 minus 32 is equal to 58. 58 times 5 ninths, you'll find out, equals 32.2. Those are the degrees Celsius. Now we're going to add 273 to that. And this will give us the temperature in Kelvin, 305 Kelvin, pretty much. So that's basically the procedure. As you can see, it's not too bad. And by the way, I'm not going to expect you or ask you to derive the equations, but I wanted to show you where they come from in case, you know, you want to have a little bit more context in the class. All right, the second mathematical tool that I have to talk to you about is called the density. Density is actually a combo of two measurements. On the one hand, you measure the mass of an object. And on the other hand, you measure the volume of that same exact object. So you basically end up getting the mass and the volume of the same thing. And if you take the ratio of these two things, the ratio of mass and volume is what we, call, what we do call density. All right, uh, now notice that this is a fraction. Because it is a fraction, it can be used as a conversion factor, specifically a conversion that can allow us to go from mass to volume or from volume to mass. Um, one extra thing to tell you is that the density of water at room temperature, I expect you to remember it as being one gram per ml. So, you know, commit that relationship to memory. All right, so to give you an example, let's say that you have 18.0 cubic centimeters of water. What's the mass of that volume? What you will have to do first is convert the cubic centimeters to mLs. And you know that for every one cubic centimeter, you have one mL. And here's where you use the density. You have mLs on top, so you need to have mLs at the bottom. And it is important to point out that I have specifically written 1.00 in association with the grams and not the mLs, because the number that you have for density will always go with the first unit that appears in this grams per whatever, right? So the, here you have grams per ml. The 1.00 goes with the grams. The ml has a placeholder one as its number. So all of this will cancel all the units out and you end up ultimately multiplying 18 by one by one divided by one. So unsurprisingly, the mass of 18 mls of water or 18 cubic centimeters of water is 18 grams. 
All right, now in the next video, I am gonna talk to you about significant figures and I'm gonna walk you through the process of looking at how the significant figures as you go from one um, inner problem to an outer problem within the scope of the same big problem. All right, so I'll see you in the next video.